Welcome, Ed. And John, we're glad to see you or have you joining us. And Jean, good to have you on uh, with us in the class. And good to have all the folks that are here in person today. So we're welcoming back Bruce Douglas, and he's no stranger to this community. So I'm not going to go through his bio, but if you would like to know more about Bruce's background, I think we have it on our website, so you can see it there. And um, we're going to launch into part two of our three-part series. And um, I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. Holy One, we gather on this glorious new day. It's your day. It's the Lord's day. And we're so thankful that we can gather in this way with this community to learn more about who you are and whose we are. I pray that as we delve deeper into the history of the Reformed tradition, that you would unite us with ancestors in the faith who were brave and bold and decisive and thoughtful in the way that they chose to follow you. Lead us in the way that you would have us go today, tomorrow, and into the future. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm reminded by that prayer of a, an experience that I've had virtually throughout my entire uh, exposure to the Reformed tradition, uh, study of it. And that is, uh, I have found myself again and again and being inspired. And, and again and again being inspired by the, by the lives, by the witness of, of these people. Uh, one of the things I want to say about that, though, is we don't have saints in the Reformed tradition. We don't have saints. Uh, every one of them is a flawed person, and I think they would have said that. They would have said, I'm full of human frailty, and and not all my thoughts are pure, and da 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 And I think that's a very important thing. I was speaking to a men's group uh, not too long ago about this, and uh, they were really cap captivated by that idea. And one of the guys in the group in particular was a Roman Catholic by background, and he was very impressed by this notion that we have, if you will, uh, sort of patriarchs or matriarchs, as the case may be, but we don't have saints. And I think there's a there's an important practical as well as theological reason for that. I'm talking, uh, as uh, you know, if you were here last time, about uh, a development in the Reformed tradition, and in, in, I'm looking specifically, focusing specifically in this series, on politics, uh, on their engagement with civil politics. And I do that because that has been one of the most important features of this tradition to the people who have been involved in developing it. Uh, they were engaged politically and they thought that was their uh, obligation. G G John Calvin characterized uh, civic life as a calling, a ministry, a high ministry, he says in the in the uh, in the institutes, that's pretty lofty language, and if you incorporate that into your vocation as somebody, and he was thinking about people who were involved in public life, if you incorporate that into your work, it's not just a job. It's not just a job at all. It's something else. Um, a year ago, when I was speaking in this setting to this group, I was talking about the laying of the foundations of the Reformed political tradition, 16th, 17th century, back, way, 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 way back. Of course, we Protestants, way, way back, it's just, just a few centuries. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about, you know, St. So-and-so all the way back there in right. the right. first century or the second century. We're, we're pikers by comparison. Right. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, we trace our roots to the 16th century, and the foundations were laid, I said last year, the foundations uh, of, of, of reform political thought, which in many respects have endured uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. 16th and 17th centuries, when people like Calvin and Knox, and a little later, Puritans like John Winthrop, uh, John Cotton, those people were sort of thinking it through, thinking, and it, they were reinventing Christianity, really. That, that was the Reformation, reinventing the, the Christian religion. If you focus on scripture, as they were doing, that, that was a great discovery. If you focus on scripture, 
and sort of have to rethink everything, where do you end up? It's I, I, When I get my mind around that, it kind of blows my mind. They were involved in this project. What does our worship look like? Uh, what does our marriage life look like? For example, if you if you if you abandon the idea that marriage is a sacrament, which is the basis of the prohibition against divorce, just think of the upheaval that creates, or economics, or politics, or and they're going back to the Bible in each case and saying, what does the Bible teach? And they really did very creative things because of because of that. So the, the laying of the foundations had to do with the, the attempt to create a kind of biblical approach to public law, to politics. And they laid these foundations pretty well because they endured. Now that doesn't mean they, there was not change. There was change, but change on a foundation. If you get my metaphor here. Change on a foundation. Uh, this this uh, a tradition passes down the things from the original source and then adapts and then changes and adapts. Why? Why is it that adaptation and change necessary? Because new circumstances. Even if you were a devoted follower of John Calvin, and none of them were quite that devoted, uh, but if you were a devoted follower of Calvin and then you encounter something like the exploration of the new world, the Puritans, well, my goodness, that's not something Calvin contemplated. So then how do you, how do you relate? So I, 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 I talked last year about the laying of the foundations, and this year I'm going on to the next stage, part two, if you will, 1700s, 1800s, very different time. The founding of the American Republic, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, Adam Smith, all, all that stuff is now, so, and of course the colonization of the wider world, huge, uh, all, all this is sort of happening. And I'm asking the question, uh, as they built on the foundation, built on the inheritance that they were given, what did they do? What did they do in thinking these big topics that were suddenly sort of projected onto the screen of culture and politics and their own consciousness in that time? I'm talking in, in this uh, series about three things. I could have mentioned six, but fortunately for you, there are only three weeks. Uh, <laughs> But, but but three just three topics that, and and I want to stress I think these were on their minds. You you, you can tell from their writings, boy, they were on their minds. The first one that I discussed last week is revolution. Uh, revolution, by the way, which suddenly has a new currency. Uh, words like insurrection uh, were very much a part of their minds. Why? Because there was the emergence of the American War for Independence, leading to the creation of the American Republic, a revolution. And then there was, at the same time, the French Revolution. And then, as you move into the latter part of this uh, period, the 1800s, there is a just a series of revolutions all over Europe. The kind of dominoes fall. Uh, I once, when I sort of was thinking about this, sketched out for a class that in, in the history of Western Europe, you've got upheavals in the 1830s, in the eight, late 1840s, in the 1860s, in the 1870s. And in each of those cases, you can point to particular governments that are being toppled uh, as a result of revolutionary politics. Now, question I asked last week was, are reform forebears, how did they react to it? And the answer is that they reacted with a kind of split screen. They looked at the kind of revolution that was emerging in this part of the world in the United States, or what became the United States, they affirmed that. And in part, they affirmed it because there were big players in it. Uh, as I said last week, the, the Presbyterian and Congregationalist presence in the struggle for independence in this country and the building of the new republic was huge. So much so that the Brits tended to complain that the Presbyterians are all on the wrong side. Uh, Presbyterians are all on that side over there, and they 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 as a, they punished the Presbyterians for that. Took over the College of New Jersey and made the chapel into a stable, and you know did various other kind of indignities. And I talked about the role that the president of the College of New Jersey at that point, a Scot named Witherspoon, played in the American founding. Huge role. Big role, probably the most prominent 
religious figure who was a public figure at that time. And he had very definite views about all the, the big issues of the time, including, interestingly enough, economics. I just briefly alluded to that last time, but he wrote a whole book on stable currency. I don't know why he would have been, felt the need to become so learned, but he did on matters of currency. Uh, in a sense, it's an obvious topic for somebody who's a politician, uh, but in any case. On the other hand, when the French Revolution happened just uh, uh, literally a, a few years later, they were appalled. And you have this distinction that begins to develop, which is a very important distinction over time, between two different kinds of politics reflected in two different kinds of revolution. One is, shall we say, orderly and in its own way, very disciplined, and the other is kind of a mob uh, uh, activity leading to terror, leading to despot, all that stuff. Uh, they made a distinction at the time, which has endured in a, shall we say, a little serious writing and thinking about this, between these two kinds of revolution. The, the uh, if you will, the English approach to, the American more specifically approach to revolutionary politics and the French. Now today I want to talk about, and by the way, they, they had, they had, reasons rooted in their own tradition for affirming one and and disliking the other. Today I want to talk about a related topic, democracy. Democracy. Mm -hmm. now, I need to make a several clarification points to begin. Um, the meaning of democracy is superficially simple and straightforward and in fact complicated. <laughs> Superficial, superficially, it just looks obvious. In fact, it's complicated. We have been reminded of that in the events of our own time. <laughs> Whatever you think about the events of our own time, it does have the silver lining of forcing people to think more deeply about what I would characterize as the fundamentals of politics. There is an inherent ambiguity in the idea of democracy, even as we think of it in a very simple and straightforward way. Empowerment of the people. Empowerment of the people. The ancient meaning of democracy was ruled by the demos, the people, the many, as opposed to the few. That goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle and the ancient Greeks. The rule by the few is the aristocratic element, the people who are better educated, the people who are wealthier, the people who have superior socials, all the, the few fill in the content, as opposed to the many. The many. And so for Plato and Aristotle in particular, but there were others as well, the, democracy was not a good idea. It was not a good idea because what? It brought into public life and empowered the people who were least qualified to rule. The least qualified to rule. And in fact, the least disciplined in their own lives. They had a very, very negative view of the many. So the last thing you wanted to do was have a democracy. The last thing you wanted to have a democracy. That was a recipe for bad, bad, bad stuff. You wanted rule by the few. And that idea endured for centuries, for centuries. I want to suggest that one of the things that I kept stressing to students when I was teaching is that the democratic idea for most of Western history was perceived to be a bad idea. That is by, by people who were well-informed, like people in this room. They would have looked at that idea at an earlier time and said, oh, oh, what a terrible, how can, any, how can any reasonable person like that? So one of the most important things to grasp about the development of modern ideas, and not just modern ideas at the beginning, but somewhat later we're talking about here, not the time of the Reformation, not the 16th century, not the 17th century, but the 18th century, and even more the 19th century, that's finally when people begin to say, well, this is not a bad idea. And of course, ultimately, to say, I think, too bloggedly, well, it's a good idea. Full stop. Now, I want to suggest, I said earlier, there's ambiguity to this idea. I want now to draw all, out that ambiguity, and then I'm going to talk about it for the rest of the hour. Um, 
Who are the people? Who are the people? The American people. Who are the people? Now, in that ancient idea of democracy, the people is a subset of the total population. Everybody clear? It's a subset of the total population. It's the many versus the few. <laughs> many versus the multiple. And democracy in that sense, in the sense that I referred to as the ancient in that sense, in the sense of democracy, is unmistakably a partisan class notion. A class partisan notion. It's us over against them. And I hope you're already sensing that's not entirely gone away. Mm -hmm. the, the, those elites over there. So one meaning of democracy is a partisan notion which divides the population into the many and the few and says, in effect, the many are going to prevail over the few so that democracy has that component too. There's another idea of democracy, which probably is the one that most people in this room have got, I'm guessing, and that is the whole people, all the people. Everybody clear? That's just the fundamental distinction. Is it a class notion or an inclusive notion? And one of the reasons why democracy became, over time, a more appealing idea, even a kind of celebrated idea, was that people began to think of it in the latter terms. That is, it's an inclusive project as opposed to a partisan project. But I want to suggest to you what we have been reminded of in our own time is that that partisan idea has never entirely gone away. It's always been a kind of undercurrent and to some extent, sometimes it surfacing openly uh, uh, sort of strain within democratic <laughs> politics and democratic uh, practice and democratic ideas. One other uh, important clarification I want to make at the beginning as I talk about democracy as a concept and as a set of practices uh, is that you, one of the most important things to grasp, which is rarely discussed, I think appropriately, is democracy as it was experienced by the ancients was a phenomenon of very small political units, city states. Uh, Aristotle makes the point, and I think it's a very shrewd observation. You need some kind of sense of community in order for democracy to work well. By the way, that's an undercurrent of what sometimes is called communitarian thinking in, in, in our own public life. A small political unit, a city state. That's what, that's what Athens was, that's what Sparta was, and so forth. A very small, or you might say, Massachusetts Bay Colony. You know, very small units. And for the longest time, the idea was, insofar as democracy has any workability at all, it's in small units. Now, the people who said this is a bad idea would probably also, if pressed, add, well, maybe it can work in small places, but certainly not in anything like a nation state, let alone an empire. Now, here comes the point that I'm trying to wind up to make here. By and large, when we think of democracies today, we think of nation states. We think of it as a way of governing nation states. And one of the most important debates that happens in this period is, is it at all possible to apply anything like democratic ideas to a large nation like France, mm -hmm. let alone, pardon my yelling, let alone this sprawling thing called these 13 colonies called the United States of America. And by the way, if you read the Federalist Papers, which is, the, I think, the main source of American political thought at the beginning, wonderful document. By the way, if you want to read just one of them, you're short on time. Uh, read Federalist Number 10. It's, it's, the, it's the clear statement of sort of the basic principles of the American Republic at a time when they're being articulated and people are trying to make the case for them. And by the way, the guy who wrote that was James Madison, who was a student of John Witherspoon. And many people look at it and say, that's Witherspoon's philosophy articulated in a very nuanced form having to do with statecraft. Now, let me stress here. It, in this period, when we're talking about the sort of laying of the foundations of modern democracy, 
late 18th, early 19th century, people are trying to get their minds around the possibility of a democracy which governs a nation state. Now, the main idea still, well into the 19th century, is no, 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 this is not going to work. Why? Because and you can understand this argument. The more you get this large, complex, sprawling thing that is a nation state, the more you are pulled in the direction of some form of elite or autocratic leader. That's just the way it's going to be. So we're talking about nation states. And I, I hope you're already getting a sense of the complexity of this. The modern move in the direction of embracing democratic ideas had to go through this if you will, this ter terrain that I'm describing here is an intellectual terrain, sorting out who are the people and, 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 and on what kind of uh, entity are we talking about here, just a small unit or a large one, etc. The last thing I want to say by way of introduction is this. I, I, I love this image, which is uh, from a great student of politics named Sam Huntington, Samuel Huntington, now deceased. He had this theory, which I think is a very good way of understanding the history of democratic politics in modern times. He says, think of it as a series of waves, like one's coming on the beach. A series of waves, democratic waves. There's one in the late 18th century and early 19th century, and then gradually there's, and by the way, the, the, the implication is, and then there's this pressure pushing back, forward, back, forward, and then he traces a whole series of them where there were important gains made in the expansion of democratic politics starting in the late 18th century, all the way through the 19th century, into the 20th century, into, he, he died near the end of the century, the end of the 20th century, and he said, by the way, about the 1960s, he said, this is another very important surge because it has to do in the American case with race. And then you look at that and think, Basically, what was going on there was a long process in which the electorate was expanded, was being expanded. Because for the longest time, I'm sure you knew, you, you all know, democracy meant males, white males in this country. And in many other countries as well, or property-owning males was another one. Property-owning, white, you know, and so forth. All these, and then eventually, working class males, and then eventually, women and then eventually people of color and so on. Sort of an ongoing. You could argue that the United States became a democracy in any defensible sense only in the 1960s. For, for what I hope are obvious reasons. And you could also argue, and this will be my position, I don't think the United States had a democratic election, democratic presidential election until 1828. Why? Because only at that period did you begin to get the sort of steady movement in all the states and colonies towards something like the universal male front suffrage, the Jacksonian suffrage. It took from the founding of the country, the founding of the republic in the 18, uh, in the 1780s and 90s, all the way up to 1828 to get the states, and this was in the hands of the states, of course to finally accept the idea of something approaching universal male suffrage. So that's the background, what I'm talking about today. I'm winding up here, but that, that's the background. I hope a certain image is forming in your mind. Democracy suddenly, and of course the fascinating question, which I will not answer. You can raise your hand afterwards, I, because I don't have an answer. I've got conscious. Why did this change? Why did, why did this happen? Why did, People develop a different attitude towards popular government in the 18th and 19th century. One of those great questions of history. I think I'll, I'll say I'll, I think it has something to do with industrialization. I think it also has something to do with the ground being laid by the Reformation and the Enlightenment. I think it's a combination of things. That, but by the way, you're nodding. I think the Industrial Revolution is important. Now. You have this process unfolding in this period, and by the way, it's on people's minds. I I have to just, as an aside here, throw in a, a little story about John Stuart Mill, who was a very important figure in English politics in the middle of the 19th 
19th century, the 1850s and 60s. He was a member of parliament, great liberal thinker, and so forth. He paints a picture of the upheaval in Britain over the possibility of even part of the male working class getting the vote in the 1860s that looks very much like a riot. There was so much opposition to the idea of these ordinary workers getting the vote that there were things that the parliament was, was worried about whether it was a little bit like you know, January 6th. Uh, you know, kind of a worry about whether or not the, the safety of the parliamentarians could be, could be, this is over the vote. So as, as, as recently as uh, the 1860s in Britain, there was a lot of pushback against anything like a nor an ordinary manifestation of democratic. And by the way, that prevailed. A big part of the working class got the vote and da da da. You see, the guy did not come down. Now, back to the reform tradition. Our spiritual forebears live through this with a tradition. That's what a tradition is. You inherit something. And I want to say, if a tradition is working well, it somehow works its way into you. So that your instincts are to do this rather than that. And that's precisely the case in this, in this instance. They, 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 they had these ideas in their mind about what was the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do in politics. Well, what were some of these ideas? I want to mention just two or three from last year, things I talked about last year. The first one I've already alluded to, I want to come back and pick up on it and polish it a little. One of the most important things John Calvin ever said, I think, at least for our subject, is in that very important last chapter of the Institutes, which is on civil government. The whole you know, hundreds of pages on theological topics, and then it comes to this. And he said something there which contradicted a lot of the popular thinking of the time, especially among theological types. He says, to put it negatively, first of all, he says, politics is not a polluted thing. A wonderful image. It's not a polluted thing. Well, why would you say that? Well, because a lot of people think, oh, it is a polluted thing. Um, still, a lot of people think it's kind of, ooh, don't go into, don't be child, man. Don't, don't, you, you don't want a child to grow up to be one of those. <laughs> you know, dirty stuff, dirty stuff. And th there was a kind of elegant theological formulation of that, that the only reason we've got civil government is because of human sinfulness. Only reason. To keep us protected against the worst tendencies of human sinfulness. Calvin, that was not Calvin's view. He knew that that was part of it. You have to punish criminals. You have to defend against the external attack. But that's not the real heart of politics right now. It's not a polluted thing. Power is of God. I've often thought, boy, that explains a lot about Presbyterians. <laughs> Presbyterians are not uncomfortable with public power. There are some versions of Christianity where people are kind of uncomfortable with wielding power, let alone grabbing for it. I've always been struck by the fact, ever since I was a kid, I remember growing up in a church in which a lot of people in that church were public officials. <clears throat> And they were, it's in, in my mind, as a kid growing up, I thought they were just wonderful people. Good God-fearing Presbyterians that probably, you know, the press would think of their, their public, their careers in just the way that John Calvin portrayed a ministry. He actually said that civic life is a ministry. Now, having said all that, I need to stress something. He did not believe it was a civic, it was something that everybody was called to, to put it mild. It was something you had to look, and by the way, this was the whole logic of calling look unto thyself and see what God has put in there. It's a sort of theological version of career counseling. <laughs> no, look and see what God has gifted you with. Take a careful assessment. Pray about it. Read your Bible. 
And some of us will conclude that, keep in mind, Calvin's background was in the law. He was not a clergy person, he was a layman. You will be probably thinking of yourself as somebody with gifts that could be appropriately used there. If so, think of that as what your ministry, your ministry to which to seek and wield public power. And by the way, some of the Puritans had wonderful sermons about ministry. Was, again, it's sort of you know, it was almost like a, a little career counseling to the to the younger members of the congregation. But not for everybody. As a matter of fact, Calvin drew, I think, far too sharply, a distinction between public men and private men. Politics is not for everyone. He had the view that except for some, which I'm about to get into, some elements of public participation, the right thing to, what should happen is that the people who are called to public life serve in public life, and the others, for the most part, let them do their thing. This is, to some extent, an aristocratic idea. Aristocratic in the, in, the, in the pure sense. People who are qualified, let them run things, now here, so that's the first thing. This is this, this is an aristocratic idea. And I think that's one of the reasons why Calvin was not a Democrat. He was not a strong Democrat, certainly. He did not believe, as some people will tell us to this day, anybody can do politics. Anybody should, you, you, you know, and anybody's opinion uh, is valid. No, no, no. I think Calvin probably would have said a bit too tersely, read some books. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, or... Or think a little more deeply about that. Any opinion will do. No! Some are called, some are not. On the other hand, Calvin also believed that it was a civic responsibility of every person within certain parameters, a civic responsibility of everybody as a matter of faith to, to be involved in politics. To vote, to go to public meetings, which is why in Geneva, and Massachusetts Bay Colony, and all these places where they did what they, when they really got their way, that's the kind of ethos you had, a sort of mobilization of people for public life. Now, the same guy who was, a, who was a physician, or a farmer, or a, you know, whatever, would also have some sense of, him, even though he was not called to politics, he was responsible to be involved in public life. Now, I hope you sense a certain, a certain image is forming in your mind here. A mixed regime, that was what it was called. A mixed regime which mixed aristocratic and democratic elements. Mixed regime. Very close to the idea of a republic, which was this favorite theme of many of our forebears in talking about this matter. So they wanted, if you will, a politics which recognized superior gifts while at the same time uh, drew people in uh, for appropriate accountability. That is, those who wielded power needed to be accountable. They needed to answer. John Winthrop, for example, was re-elected governor again and again and again for many years until he got to a place where he, the public disagreed with him. And he was thrown out. All right. That's, their, that's what they got in their minds. That's what Witherspoon has got in his mind. Some version of by the way, what he thinks he's doing at uh, the uh, educational institution over which he presides is preparing people for that. Originally, the College of New Jersey was for clergy, and then gradually it expanded so that it had more and more lay people, including many of the people, several, I don't want to overstate, several of the people who wound up in the Continental Congress, most notably Madison. That's the background. That's what's in their minds. Now they encounter these unfolding waves of democracy. You can imagine what their response is. But let me highlight and try to capture, I think, the core of it by referring to a famous book on democracy that probably everybody in this room has heard of. It's a, it's a long book, and it's a complicated book, and probably fewer have read it than have actually heard of it. It's Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, one of the most influential books on democratic politics ever written. 
I bring it up because it was written in the 1830s and 40s. It was a long project. And the background to it is, and by the way, the 1830s and 40s are precisely the time when some of the most important 19th century debates about democracy are coming into focus. You had the American Revolution, you had the French Revolution, and this is about 50 years later, and you had the Jacksonian surge in American politics, 1828 election, to which I refer to was come and gone. You know, you've got you've got uh, a lot of that stuff, which is the first wave and beyond. Well established, the results are clear, and so forth. He comes to this country. And I don't know whether you know the story, but it's kind of fascinating. De Tocqueville was a, was a rather conservative Catholic uh, nobleman from France who had heard, but there were two things that were in his mind as he, as he did what I'm about to describe. He was worried about France. He was worried about France because France had gone through that whole upheaval that the French Revolution represented, including the Bonaparte phase, you know, the rise of the dictator, and then a kind of ongoing revolutionary turbulence that just got manifested itself. And he was worried about the trajectory of French politics. And he associated that politics with democracy. He looked, France was really undergoing a kind of profound social revolution, a social revolution, not just a political revolution, but a social revolution, which was rooted in, in part, the idea of democracy or a version of the idea of democracy. He came to the United States because by that point you begin to see that there is such a thing as an American government, which it looks like it's going to endure. It looks like this country is not going to break apart. Although I have to tell you, a few decades, a couple of decades later, when the Civil War came, a lot of Europeans looked at it and said, look, we've known for years that that big, sprawling country was going to break apart. Try to do a democracy in a, in a country of that size. It's, it's a fool's errand. Civil War, they're going to break apart. But Tocqueville comes before that and happens. And He's looking for what he says. In the World Park, he says, I've, I, I have, I've been told that democracy is faring better in the United States. And I'm interested in figuring out why that is and what that means. And so the whole work is an attempt to diagnose the peculiarities of American politics. And he is one of the reasons why this appeals to a certain kind of person today in American politics is because he's so congratulated. Oh, the American democracy is so wonderful. And he does say eloquent things about it. And some of them are just spot on. Um, but, you know, he brushes the race issue aside. You know, that's, this is just a couple of decades before the Civil War. Um, at any rate, he, he, and he traveled the country. He, he, wondered, he goes and he reports this. And by the way, he's one of several great European commentators on American life who travel around the country. The man that I did a lot of my work on, Max Weber, the great German sociologist, did the same thing years ago, traveled around the United States and, and reports on it. You know, I went to a camp meeting, here's what it was like, and I went to a town meeting in Massachusetts, and here's what it was like, and so forth. But the, 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 the argument that he makes, uh, which has stuck and become a very important resource for people thinking about this topic and addressing who it is. He says, the more I have reflected on this phenomenon of democracy in America and compared it with my own country and what's going on there, I've come to the conclusion that democracy means fundamentally different things in those two cases. Let me say that again. Fundamentally different things. And one of them should be prized by everybody who is, and this is a key phrase, a lover of liberty. One of them should be prized by everybody who is a lover of liber liberty, and the, and the other should be despised. Prized, despised. And here's the distinction he drew. He said, well, what you see emerging in the United States is a democratic republic. Now, that's a very important 
I realize this isn't your words, but let me try to pin that down. Basically, what he was saying was, this is a country which was a republic before it became a democracy. And then the democracy was woven into the Republican institutions. Now, republic, for our spiritual forebears, was a way of talking about that thing that Calvin and others were aiming for, of a, combina a good combination of elite and pop, a mixed regime, a republic. A representative government in which you try to combine the best world, the, the best of two worlds, aristocratic leadership and democratic participation and accountability. That's what they had in mind. And in effect, I hope you see what I'm driving at here. Topo was saying, and then to a large extent, they achieved it. Or they have achieved it. And of course, he also adds very quickly, and this is a very important part of his argument, there has been a fundamental difference, he says, between these two countries in the role of religion in their public life. As a matter of fact, I think he overdoes it a little bit, but what he says is, one of the reasons why things have turned out well in this new country, the United States of America, is because religion and progressive values are marching together. Whereas in France, just the opposite is the case. The revolution has been made, what? Over against religion. Indeed, the revolution has been made to almost in a way that to, to promote a kind of anti-religious cause, a secularist cause. And then the other, so one possibility is a democratic republic. Tocqueville's idea of a really well-ordered bringing together of democratic and other, and other ideas. You might say democracy qualified by certain important elements. The, the word he uses for the other side, the, 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 the mm -hmm. version he doesn't like is Jacobin, which of course relates very nicely to the forces in French politics, the Jacobins. But I think it's pretty close to what sometimes is characterized as populist politics today. Why? Because here's what he says about he says this Jacobin form of democracy is a is a sort of adversarial way of thinking about democracy, the many over against. So democracy in that that formulation is a way of taking up arms of, of one part of society against the other, and it just very often has resulted in, that, in our country and others. It has resulted in, ironically, an increase in the powers of government as a way of what? Defending the interests of the many over against the elites. The autocratic tendencies in French politics were, were part of that. That's one of the reasons I thought it was not very congenial to the liberty. Or another way to put it is to say, he was uneasy. Maybe as a nobleman, he, you could understand why he would be uneasy about all the egalitarianism of the French Revolution uh, 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 used as a, as a weapon. So Tocqueville in the 1840s is seeing what I think is increasingly evident as the century goes by, and that is that there are different versions of democracy, different ways in which democracy can be embodied with quite rather different facts. One of my colleagues at Georgetown <clears throat> wrote a book in which he characterized Tocqueville's outlook this way. He said Tocqueville's message is that in principle, democracy is morally ambiguous. It depends. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It depends. Which version? How the, the broad democratic idea is understood and more important, embodied. <laughs> Now, with just a few minutes to go, let me now turn back to the performed actors in this in this drama. I talked about Witherspoon and Kuiper last time. Uh, a response is actually a, a weak word for what needs to be said here. Not only was there a reformed response, but there was a reformed role. Keep in mind what I've said about the role of people in the reform tradition, especially in the American case, not the French case. They had no role at all in the French case. The Huguenots had been so marginalized that uh, the most that they could get out of 
the French Revolution was relief from the persecutions that had been visited on them for over a century. But they didn't have any role in it. And they were very suspicious of it, the French Protestants, because of the secular secularism of the French Revolution. Kuiper is very interesting because, as I said last time, Abraham Kuiper is a clergyman, a Dutch clergyman, a Dutch Reformed clergyman, who rose and became a very important public figure, a politician, the founder of a political party, and ultimately, ultimately the prime minister. And a very serious intellectual. Wrote whole books on uh, politics and among other things. He also was very interested in science and art. I don't know when the guy slept. Uh, he, 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 all, all of his, he developed sort of reformed, uh, new re sort of lines of reformed thought on a whole series of times. <laughs> but he is a very important figure in thinking about our topic for the following reasons. He embraced the democratic ideas philosophy. At a time when the Netherlands was yet to become fully democratic. It was it was a great struggle running through the running through the 19th century in in in, 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 uh, in Dutch politics. And his party, the anti-revolutionary party, the anti-French Revolution party, if you will, the anti-revolutionary party was a very strong proponent of enfranchising the common people, and that's one of the reasons it happened. So this guy is a friend of democracy, but at the same time is very sensitive to, because of his antipathy to the French Revolution and all that it represented, very sensitive to what my colleague, former colleague, characterizes as moral ambiguity of democracy. And let me just say a parenthetical, I think that's a very good way to capture it. Well, I think is the, is the right position, if you will, on, on, on democracy. In principle, yes, but, now, just two things, and then I'll stop. You know this phrase to capture the spirit of the American founding, a pluribus unum. It's a very common phrase that was used at the beginning of the American founding. It was put on the money and so forth, the currency, as a way of capturing what the founders were about. And when you read, we, we were talking about this book, uh, uh, Ellis's book, uh, The Cause, you can just, uh, which is about the American family, wonderful, wonderful book. If you think about the, if you will, the politics, just the negative politics of the family, it was an extraordinary effort and feat to bring all of these disparate forces together to unify, mm -hmm. to bring them together. Just think of it, well, not just the, not, not just the economic difference. You know, Virginia is one thing. New York is another thing. Massachusetts is another thing. Religious difference. Ethnic difference. Economic difference. Could have easily splintered. It kind of, in a sense, a kind of miracle that it came together at all. And by the way, we I think we had the discussion last time. The great quote, compromise over slavery had to do precisely with that. You know, trying to hold things together. I don't think it would have come together without that particular compromise, right? which in many respects stinks. But the alternative would have been two different countries, a South and a North. And by the way, that's where people think the thing took it. At any rate, one of the themes that you find in, in Witherspoon and even more in Madison, his student, and especially in Federalist Number 10. Federalist Number 10 is so much reflective of the things you find in Witherspoon. It's almost as though Witherspoon is, is, is speaking through medicine. And I think that's just, if you want to understand the fundamentals of American politics, read that. It's about 12 pages in, in, in the normal edition. And, and here's, here's the basic idea. And it's so much reflective of the one way of thinking about democracy in contrast to the other. Madison says, there is not one people. This nation is not, this emerging nation is not, and will not be one people. And I would say that's true of almost any nation. A nation, keep in mind, not a, not a city state, a nation is big thing. It's not one people. The people is what? At least at very, in many respects, 
It's a combination of different peoples. And by the way, Madison says, they are inescapably, that's the inescapably, inescapably what a democratic republic is. It is a collection of people with this disparate interests and the way to bring them together is to constantly do two things. Let the, the, the different interests check and balance one another. Does that sound familiar? Check and balance one another. And the inevitable result, if you're going to have decent policy, is compromise. All of that is in Federalist number one, uh, number, ten, number 10. And some people have said that's a kind of Calvinism at work. Why? Because human beings are the way they are. They're varied, but they're also self-interested and done their own thing. Now, I hope you see, that's a very different idea than the people, the unified people marching together. Indeed, Madison is, and also Madison says at one point in there, respect for that diversity is essential if liberty is to be preserved. All of those ideas are in a pluribus. That's one way of thinking about democracy. If you think about democracy that way, it's hard for you to generalize quickly about the people, what the people want. Kuiper wrote a book, what, probably his first foray into serious writing about politics in the 1870s. This is well 20 years before he becomes prime minister. Calvinism, the source and guarantor of our liberties. What? And then the whole book is about con the, the idea of constitutionalism, <clears throat> rule of law, constitutionalism, rule of law. And what he says there is the following. He says, and he, and he recognizes, by the way, in that little treatise, it's more like a long pamphlet. He recognizes that Calvinism has not always been the friend of liberty. Geneva, Servetus, not always the friend of liberty, not always the song. But he said, our history is this. Our history has been that we have been led to see how precious religious liberty is. Which is why, in one, I said, what I said last night, in one country after another, we now stand for some version of religious liberty. But not only do we stand for religious liberty, we stand more broadly for all of the liberties which are guaranteed in constitutions. And it lists the various constitutions that, that emerged in this movement. These constitutions, he said, are the guarantor not just of the religious part of our liberty, but other liberties as well, because the more people think about this, the more they recognize there are a multiplicity of liberties that need to be protected. And then he says, just to complete the narrative, he says, whatever the will of the people may be, the will of the people should not be allowed to violate our liberties. And if you see that what, what's involved in that. That's a that's a kind of sort of restraint on the populist impulse to say there ought to be a law because we we will it. That's an anti-populist move move in in uh, in kind of. <laughs> um, last word. What you find, therefore, in this these are two representative figures. I can name others. What you find in this sort of development of reform political thought is a an embrace but it's qualified an embrace of the democratic idea which is qualified and, and it's an embrace precisely in, in order to recognize and deal with the, what i characterize as the moral ambiguity of democracy let me stop there questions comments rebuttals <laughs> yes in the back is the tendency towards corruption greater in your mind with aristocracies or democracies? I don't know, it's a tough call. <laughs> Ambiguous. <laughs> well, no, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you the standard answer. I mean, the standard answer is, uh, from the point of view of defenders of, I would say, most any version of democracy, is if there is corruption in a democratic regime or a regime where there's a popular or any, any degree of popular rule, you can throw them out. That's the simple answer. I think it's actually more complicated than that because we know that there are ways of getting around, manipulating, whatever. I, I, I don't think there is a good answer to that. In other words, I'm dissatisfied with the 
Here we say the simplicity of what I've just said. Yeah. Um, so one point and one question. Um, you you said Witherspoon was fascinated with currency, and yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that doesn't surprise me at all. D democracy needs devices, and yes. currency is a device unified. National debt was a device that uh, Alexander Hamilton used to try to uh, to unify. So it doesn't surprise me. But my question for you is: De Tocqueville, he's here. We have Jacksonian. Um, Populism and doesn't that scare him? Can you just talk how he reacted to that? I, I, I'm so glad you raised that question because I, I think it's there's a kind of a blindness in that. If anything, he's uh, he's um, dismissive. Uh, I, I, I mean, you, you put your finger on one or two or three things about that argument that he makes as an observer that I just think this guy really wants to see that this is this is working out well. Because that's what, what that's what the critics of Jackson would have said. Exactly. By the way, the other thing I want to go back to your point about uh, about money. The breathtaking thing to me is that Witherspoon, as a learned clergyman, also was a learned man about political economy. I mean, he by the way, he was a, he he chaired one of those committees in the Continental Congress which had to do with this sort of question. About the money supply and the importance of money supply to political stability, and he obviously, you know, was 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 an easy conversation partner with somebody like Hamilton on topics like that. That's that's well, I, don't, <laughs> I, I I won't spit out my perfect thoughts, but I, I I have to say I stand in awe of him because in the next breath he could he could he could talk about predestination at length and. And whatever, but but I, I do say I, I do agree with your, your fundamental point. If you're going to talk about these matters, you, you the, 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 the sort of the political dynamics of, uh, of the public and so forth, you'd better know something about what you're doing. Yes. After this fascinating talk, I think to me one of the best examples of modern current. Example of moral ambiguity of democracy is our Supreme Court. Uh, we have a constitution. It's a lot. It's, I think, well, that's that's my opinion. Well, uh, say more. Where are my notes here? <laughs> Well, let, let, let me just say one thing about that, which is not so much a reply directly to that point, but I, I'm sure you know that the founding fathers themselves did not apparently envision judicial review in the way that we think of it now as the Supreme Court. That is an achievement of the Supreme Court in the early days. There are actually Supreme Court cases that tested the authority of the court in relation to legislation. And there's a famous one, Marbury versus Madison, where that begins to be uh, sort of developed and articulated. Um, and by the way, that is unmistakably an aristocratic part of the American constitutional design. I hope you see why. You take a series, a very small number of people, who presumably are positioned there because of their superior knowledge on one particular topic or set of topics. And if you, if you factor in judicial review, give them enormous power. <laughs> and that's not, that's, that's, uh, they can say all they want to, uh, want to about judicial restraint. That is legislative power. We see clearly that it's legislative power. Um, and critics of our system, including a lot on the other side of the, uh, of the, of the pond, will say, well, you, as long as that institution has the power that it does, you've got something that's a kind of hybrid of democratic and other elements. I could say more, but that's just... No, that's fine. Just, it's my own thoughts. Well, but, but I, 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 I could say one other thing here. It, it's it's the... This is one more illustration of how the events of our time are raising really fundamental questions of state credit. Yeah. 
I mean, I found it interesting the way you compared the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and you're rooted to revolutions all over the world, yeah. historically speaking. One of the things that strikes me as we're trying to, as the country had in its history has tried to find a balance of what does democracy mean, checks and balances, which we're all familiar with in terms of the Constitution, all of these things. But it also strikes me that unique, and I don't know if this is unique, but I, it seems to me it might be, the fact that there were states, which I'm going back to your analysis uh, or your comments about uh, uh, city states yep. with common community uh, being uh, able to be more de democratic on a, on, a, on a local scale versus large countries that have a, a diverse population community. The fact that we have a state structure that has power and political and allowed to be different uh, as, as sort of a check and balance against the federal sure. structure that brings it together. And the fact that how that all came about is, I think, somewhat remarkable in terms of the history of this country. And that still today is strong. You go around all the states and there are differences of opinion, differences of views. And on the one hand, you could consider that is quite healthy sure. in terms of a democracy of this large a country with the federal and the states, the, 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 the butting of heads to some extent between states and federal government and between states and states on some, in some situations. And that that all adds to this whole idea of how do you bring a diverse, large country population together in a political sense with uh, different ideas, or different thoughts, but somehow getting some consensus that comes out of that. In okay, the local you, level and the and the federal level. You you touched it. These are it's so interesting how these really <laughs> important questions have suddenly popped up here. Here comes another one. Um, the United States is not unique. And the interesting thing is, oftentimes the countries which have been most naturally drawn in a federalist direction are countries in which reformed Protestants have taken the lead politically. And the most obvious example is the Netherlands. The Netherlands was seven provinces, even before the United States of America, seven provinces which kind of it was almost perfectly the way you characterized it. I could transfer it over to these Dutch, who, who what? Who rather proudly and defiantly insisted upon their independence and resisted any kind of sort of absorption into one unified nation. Even more the Swiss. Good Lord. Now, now again, <laughs> this this guy right here, Kuiper, who was pretty discerning political student of politics, pointed to that. Of course, he was Dutch himself. And he said, this federalist principle, he actually names it, he said, this federalist principle is one that is very congenial to our ears. Let me stop there. See, yeah, one, yeah. one comment, <laughs> it's not a question, is that pre-revolution uh, cartoon of Franklin's of the colonies as a snake, yeah. which was join or die. Mm. So, well, I, I I was kind of implying something, so let me now drop the eye. I think the the drawing together of these colonies was more by necessity than anything else, but not entirely. And going back to the book that you and I have been talking about, I think there was in the minds of the people who actually made the took the steps necessary to bring them together a sense that the unity was preferable to the alternative. Mm -hmm. Preferable to the alternative, not just as necessary. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm sure you all know, the first, it's the first sort of stab at this, the Articles of Confederation quickly were perceived to be inadequate on the very point you, you mentioned, that is too much on top. Uh, so they, if you will, they do it as a redo, which brings us to the Constitution, which is what clearly was not. I'm a little amused when people talk about the, the founders being so opposed to unity. I mean, they, they really wanted to bring people to it was stronger, a more perfect union. That was the that was the driving intent. Next week we're going to talk about something more complicated, I think. <laughs> <laughs> National. Yeah. Okay. See you next week. Great. Yeah.